Hello, second graders. Today we're going to read Goonie Bird Green, Chapter 3. On Friday, Goonie Bird was wearing capri pants, a satin pink top, tank top, and a long string of pearls. Her red hair was twisted into one long braid, which was decorated with plastic flowers, and there were flip-flops on her feet. You look beautiful, Kiko said to Goonie Bird in an admiring whisper. Yes, I know, Goonie Bird replied. Thank you, Kiko. She walked to the front of the classroom and Miss Pigeon told her it was time. Malcolm was in the back of the classroom. He was at his desk writing, I will never put anything in my nose 100 times on a piece of lined paper. The nurse had told him to do that. She said it would keep his hands busy. How come Goonie Bird gets to stand in front of the class? Malcolm asked. Shh, everybody except Felicia Ann said to Malcolm, listen. Today, Goonie Bird said, I have a very exciting story to tell you. In my story, there was a long journey, a mystery, and a rescue. Ms. Pigeon, seated at her desk, had begun correcting some spelling papers. She looked up. Listen, second graders, she said. Hear the different things that Goonie Bird is putting into her story? That's what good storytellers do. Goonie Bird listened patiently to the teacher. Then she stood up straight and did some breathing exercises. Finally, she took a deep breath and looked at the class. I'm ready to begin, she said at last. The title of the story for today will be How Goonie Bird Came from China on a flying carpet. Here she is getting ready to begin. Just like Aladdin, Barry Tuckerman said in a loud whisper. Barry, pay attention, please. Goonie Bird said, I'd like to have absolutely all eyes on me. Then when the class became silent, all except Felicia Ann, who had been silent all along, and almost all eyes, even Miss Pigeons, were on her, she began. The font changes, and this is when her story begins. How Goonie Bird Came from China on a Flying Carpet. Once upon a time, just last month, Mr. and Mrs. Green decided to take their little girl, Goonie Bird, and move away from the place where they'd always lived. They'd always lived in China, but now Mr. Green had a new job, and his new job was in Water Tower. That's here! Chelsea said aloud, I live in Water Tower. Goonie Bird stopped talking. She arranged her pearl necklace that it was draped over one shoulder. Me too, Trisha said. We all live in Water Tower, Ben pointed out. That's why we go to Water Tower Elementary School class, Miss Pigeon warned. Miss Pigeon, Goonie Bird said politely, let me take care of this. Children, she said in a firm voice, I cannot tell a story if I'm constantly interrupted. There will be time for questions and comments. Please raise your hand if you want to say something. It's very distracting for me to hear you call out. Sorry, Trisha said. Sorry, Chelsea said. Sorry, Ben added. The class waited. Goonie Bird looked at them all sternly. Then she did some breathing exercises and began again. They had always lived in China, but now Mr. Green had a new job, and his new job was in Water Tower. So they packed carefully, took many days. First, Mr. Green had to pack 43 sets of false teeth. Then Miss Green had to pack her dancing shoes and her bathing suits, and Goonie Bird had to pack all of her belongings, which included a money collection. Finally, the furniture was loaded into a moving van, and the Green family waved goodbye as the moving van drove away from Char China and started its journey to Water Tower. Goonie Bird stopped. Every child in the classroom had a hand raised, and even Miss Pigeon was waving her arm. We have an intermission now for questions, Goonie Bird said. Chelsea, yours first. Why did Mr. Green have 43 pairs of false teeth? Chelsea asked. The false teeth are not a part of this story, Goonie Bird said. Malcolm? Malcolm looked up from his paper. I will not put anything in my nose paper. His eyes were very wide. Tell me about the money collection, he said. That's another story, Goonie Bird said. Beanie, then when are you going to tell us about the prince and the diamonds, Beanie asked. Goonie Bird thought it over. On Monday, I'll tell it, she said. Now there's time for one more question before I continue. Ms. Pigeon, did you have your hand raised? Ms. Pigeon nodded. Goonie Bird, she said in a nice voice, you have an amazing imagination and we think you are wonderful at telling stories, don't we, class? She looked around and most of the children nodded, but I wanted to be certain that the children understand that these are made up stories. So I want to point out, my stories are all absolutely true, Goonie Bird said. I want to point that out, Miss Pigeon went on, that of course we all know that China is a foreign country across the ocean and that a moving van could never drive from China to Water Tower. Goonie Bird rearranged her pearls and sighed. Miss Pigeon, she asked, why don't we take a few minutes for research? Is there an atlas in the bookcase? Miss Pigeon laughed and said, of course. She went to the bookcase and took out a map, book of maps called an atlas. Now, said Goonie Bird, would you 
find out if there are any other Chinas. Other Chinas? I don't think, Ms. Pigeon began turning the pages of the atlas. She found the index at the back. My goodness, Ms. Pigeon said after a minute. There's a China in Texas. Correct, said Gwynny Bird. And where else? There's a China in Maine. Correct, said Gwynny Bird. And California, there's a China Lake. And oh my goodness, look in North Carolina. And now it is time we continue the story, Gwynny Bird announced. Where were we? Oh yes, the moving man had just left China. She took up the story again. After the moving man left China, the Green family loaded up their station wagon with five big suitcases and they added a lawnmower that they, were, they had forgotten to put in the moving van, a cooler full of hand sandwiches and iced tea, a bundled up stack of Nation, National Geographics, and an orange and white cat named Catman who had no tail because he had flicked his former tail once under the lawnmower. The last thing they put in the station wagon was a rolled up rug from the front porch of their house. It was too long to fit. They tried it sideways and folded and upside down, but it still wouldn't fit. Let's leave it behind, Mr. Green suggested, but Mrs. Green began to cry. It was my mother's, she said. There's a stain on it where my mother spilled some black bean soup 40 years ago. I feel so sentimental about that rug. So Mr. Green agreed to take the rug because it made him cry too if his wife cried. He decided to put the back window of the station wagon down so that the end of the rolled up rug could stick out. He made certain that everything was nicely arranged and that Catman had a comfortable place to sleep in the back seat just beneath the end of the rug and next to a place where Goonie Bird would sit. Mr. Green and Mrs. Green and Goonie Bird Green all got into the car and drove away from China starting their long journey to Water Tower. They drove for many, many hours. They ate all of the ham sandwiches and drank all the iced tea. They stopped to get gas. They went to the bathroom. They played the car radio and listened to news and operas and football games and talk shows and about love relationships. Soon, he, soon Goonie Bird glanced down and noticed with dismay that her beloved Catman had disappeared. She looked around to the floor of the back seat, but Catman was not there. She heard a small sound like a purr coming from inside the rolled up rug. She knew that Catman had entered the rug. He probably found it warm and dark in a cozy place. But Goonie Bird was worried about Catman. She tried to get him out. She reached into the rolled up center of the rug, but he slithered away beyond her hands. She looked at the backs of her parents' heads, wondering if she should tell them about the problem with Catman. But her mother was dozing and her father was driving, watching the road carefully and listening to a radio show program about whales. So Goonie Bird decided to wiggle into the rug herself to rescue Catman. Oh no, Kiko said, I'm going to faint. Shh, the other children said. It was dark and dusty and a very tight squeeze inside that rolled up rug, but Goonie Bird wiggled inch by inch toward Catman. Catman slithered away inch by inch. She could see his glittering eyes as he backed away from her hands. Goonie Bird was determined to rescue him. She continued forward. Suddenly an amazing thing happened. Even though Goonie Bird was not very large and did not weigh very much, and was not wearing her heavy diamond earrings from the palace that day, her weight inside the rolled up rug caused it to tilt moment, Mr. Green leaned forward to change the radio station and the car went over a pothole in the road. That rolled up rug containing both Catman and Goonie Bird slid out of the back of the station wagon and flew through the air before it landed at the side of the road into some thick grass beyond a fence post. A cow chewing a purple flower looked curiously at it and then wandered away. The station wagon drove on around a curve in the road, slowly the rug unrolled. Catman's fur was standing on end and if he'd had a tail, his tail would have been sticking straight up in the air. For a moment, Catman stood still looking at Goony Bird. Then he ran away very fast. Goony Bird sat up. She was not entirely sure what had happened, but she was not hurt. She simply wondered where her family was and her cat and the car. Other cars stopped and people got out. Many people offered her a drink of water from their bottles of Evian, but Goony Bird wasn't thirsty. After a while, a police car came with a flashing light. A TV reporter came and a cameraman and with the policeman talked on his radio, the TV reporter, a woman with very large hair, interviewed Goony Bird and called her the little girl who had a flying carpet ride. In the interview, Goony Bird described Catman and asked people to call the station if they'd found him, but she never got Catman back. Eventually, the police car took her to her parents where they were both crying at the gas station four miles down the road. When Goonie Bird and her parents were finally reunited, everyone, including a two policemen, a TV reporter, and the gas station owner hugged and kissed and did the tango. The end. What a lovely story, Miss Pigeon said. An exciting one, too, but a little sad to lose your kitty in that way. Catman is not a kitty, Goonie Bird said. He is a cat. I didn't say that I lost him, I just said that I never got him back. So no one found him and called the TV station. 
Actually, they did, Glenbird replied. But where's Catman now, asked Miss Pigeon. He was consumed by a cow, Glennybird said, but that's a different story. By a cow? You're joking, Miss Pigeon said. No, said Glennybird. I'm not joking. I tell only absolutely true stories. Tell it, tell it, the children called. I will, Glennybird said. Another day.